Welcome to Talking May with a Bowtie Boy. I'm Tom Saviello, and I have my good friend, David Trahan. Do you know you realize we've known each other for over 20 years? Yeah, well, I looked in the mirror the other day and said, yeah, I think you I'm know, getting up there in age. Yeah, but you still got some dark hair up there. Well, I, I might have colored a little bit. <laughs> oh, you got some of that Grecian <laughs> <laughs> Stuff. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I yeah. go back because I was actually telling somebody. And so David's with Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, and we're going to talk about that, yeah, but i got to tell sure. a couple of David stories that are my favorites. Uh, is you, you are the one who brought OPEGA into the state of Maine. Government you know? Oversight Agency, CDC. absolutely. And, and yeah. I can remember when I first <clears throat> got here down there as a Democrat yeah. in the legislature saying, wow, this is the greatest idea mm -hmm. in the world, non-biased, yeah. even sides. Yeah. We really can do some good work. And the Democrats were mad at me. Yeah. They were mad at you. They yeah. thought it was a, a, a an effort to go after state employees. Mm. But I don't know whether you remember, I had a, 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 a plaid court, and I, 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 and I had the, <laughs> the, the Opega thing, and I would go like this with you. And yeah. That was that was a great piece of work, David. Yeah, it took seven years to do it. And really, it's, it's a fundamental, foundational piece of government to go back and review programs, see if they're still timely, are they, are they acting efficiently, using you know taxpayer resources properly. It's pretty common around the country. Nearly every state has one, and, and it, it was a battle. Um, that everything, no matter how good something is now in government, it's a battle. Yeah. As but, always and keep fighting. in mind that that organization has grown to be more the inspector general. That, it that is. If there's it an is. issue beyond yeah. those things, right. they'll dig into it because yeah. they have subpoena power. It's the only uh, committee that has right. outright subpoena power. That's right. It's where the legislators go when they want the truth, is how I describe it. It's 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 doing exactly what it was intended to do. Now it started out controversial with the Turnpike Authority because their director went to jail over some right. of the things that he was doing. So it scared a lot of people. But that's not a bad thing. No, it's not. People pay more attention when they know that they can be looked at, so they're going to act more efficiently and, and more appropriately. And I think it's been very successful. Yeah, and the last David story I'll tell them, then we'll go to, is that yeah. when you were in the Senate, you were sitting in back of me when I got elected. And so when you took the job with Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, your chair was open, mm -hmm. and I had the next seniority to go into that chair. And you were the most likely, voted the most likely not to be in your chair. And, and, and so when I got into it, I found out it wasn't really you, it was the chair. Because it was, I was the chair. Say, it was the chair, I can tell you. Because I was most likely after that not to be in my chair. I used to say I had Trahan's disease. So yeah. it was the chair that did it. Yeah, you know, it, it, I might have a little bit of a disorder of some sort. I just can't sit still. My wife will tell you that. But you could have sat in my seat anytime you wanted because I wasn't in it. I was doing my work. <laughs> yeah, I, was out, work. I was out doing my work. And, and really a lot of that stuff in the Senate is symbolic anyway. It's a lot of moving. If you look at, at Congress in some of the debates, you'll have one senator in an empty room yeah, giving an pa impassioned speech to the Senate. Yeah. If you don't know um, that, it, that they're doing that, that, that's yeah. what it's about. Yeah. But how many years now have you been with Sportsman's uh, Alliance? Going on 11 years, now. 11 years now. 11 years, is yeah. that that long? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's been quite an adventure. I bet it has. We started with uh, pretty much an empty building and the lights out. Because when, when I took over Sam, they had had several directors that were very short-termers, um, and the organization was kind of floundering. And I remember Becky Morell, I had mentioned she's my office manager. She had also been um, treasurer of my campaigns when I ran for the Senate. I knew her personally, and I had recommended to the, at, the at the time Matt Dunlap, ex-Secretary of State, that he hire her because she was top-notch, and he did. And so when I came in just after that, um, the lights were out, and I said, Becky, when I came in the door, I said, well, why are the lights out? She goes, well, we're trying to save money. Oh, wow. And I said, well, turn the lights on, and then while I'm director, the lights here will never be out. So we started there. We now have six people, two full-time, um, four part-time people. We have an education center we've built, 112 acres, two kids fishing ponds, a shooting range, uh, miles of trails. It's used by youth groups. Uh, we have our building was a six hundred thousand dollar mortgage. That's all paid off. Wow! Um, everything that we have is paid for, and we're we're doing great work. We also created a C four for our political activity, so our education works separate. Um, all of our political activity is conducted under the C four, and it enables us to be truly an educational C three nonprofit. So we have both of them. Wow. Yeah, you really so, turned it around. Yeah, because I, mean, I remember when you took the job, the lights were about to go out. Yeah, they Financially, were. Financially, they were in deep doo doo. Yep. Um, and you really, the voice was minimalized in the legislature. There yeah. wasn't. I mean, 
you, you still had our good old friend George Smith that still would do his stuff and yeah. drive us crazy. Yeah. Bless your heart, George. <laughs> That's <man>. right. <laughs> and I mean, uh, you know, I, yeah. that was a unique experience because I got to spend a lot of time with him in his last year yeah. and had a lot of great conversations. Yeah, with him. George was a character. I, I had, at the time I was a legislator, I sponsored most of the sand bills and carried their water. The, uh, the other thing that we've done is we've built up our reserves to uh, nearly half a million dollars. Really? Yeah, it's been, it's been really probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my political career in, in moving on to Sam was it's different going from being a politician to an administrator and having to build a structure. And it's taken, we've had good leadership on our board and I think Sam now is looked at and respected at the State House at a level that it's never seen. I just got a call a few days ago from the governor to come in and help with a very complex issue, which I did. I get a call from either side's leadership at any given time to help out with issues. And so I'm pretty proud of the, the respect level that we have now at the, at the State House. Uh, and it should be because Maine is sportsmen. That's what it it's is. all about. You know, it, it's just all about that's what it we are. It makes no difference what political no, party no political you're from. Party, yeah. If you love the outdoors, you love the outdoors. Yeah, I yeah, mean, uh, we can all argue about how the management might be different or that's better right. or whatever, but we're yeah. arguing around biology. We're, we each of us have our facts and so yeah. forth, but we're not arguing. Are the deers Democrat or Republicans, <laughs> David? I don't think that there's I mean, any. Uh, they're, according to some, they say the moose voted in the last election. That's why that Trump wanted to negate <laughs> okay. it in Maine because <laughs> right. those moose guys got yeah. in there. And, yeah. So tell us about some of the programs so yeah. uh, you might you yeah. want to start with education youth sure um, we we had a donation of 44 acres of land back I think it was three years ago a little over three years ago just raw land it needed all kinds of work no roads nothing and I said to my board I won't ask you to you know I guess weaken the organization in other areas I'll do this on my own I'll build an education center because I think that's the future young people just they're choosing between computers and, and the outdoors, and I want to give them that outdoor experience as early as possible. So I said, I think this is important for Sam to do, to be a leader in outdoor education. So we started writing, I started writing grants, our volunteers and membership stepped up. We've turned it into a magnificent facility. We, we cleared about six acres of fields, um, put in outdoor facilities, two kids fishing ponds, a shooting range, which we just used not too long ago to help Bureau of Veterans Services. Some of their counselors wanted to learn about firearm education. We gave them a day-long course, took them to the range. They actually shot. Uh -huh. The reason they wanted to do that, Tom, is important. When they're talking to veterans who have lived a life with firearms and they know nothing about them and suicide may be an issue, how do these counselors talk if they don't know, have some experience with firearms? So. They wanted to begin that process of educating themselves about firearms and how they fit in with people's lives. and So that was the beginning of, I think, a very important program. So that, that um, education center has already held the Envirothon finals. Okay, and I, I judged you must, one time long yeah. years ago. Yeah. And they're going to hold it there again this year. They liked our facility so much. Everything's wheelchair accessible. We have a barn we've completely restored into a little classroom. We have a structure over our shooting range, and we're building actually another building on the site. So we're sort of like building a little university for education, similar to this one, but just a small version of it, and it's now grown to 112 acres. So are there, are there specific classes that you're doing with the kids? We'll do anything. Anything. We don't, we don't tell the kids what we want them to like. We say, if you want to have experience in the outdoors, you tell us what you want, and then we'll get instructors to help you. We, we partner with 4-H, which is a university-based program. All of their programs have curriculum. We use their, some of their instructors. Our instructors are trained to be 4-H instructors. I really like their, their curriculum and um, everything, every instructor must go through a very vigorous process, including background checks, to, to educate at our facility. And we think the public deserves the best. You know, before we go, I'll get you to give Andre the uh, your contact information so we can sure. we can run it across the bottom of the screen. Sure, so, you know, so absolutely. That people know how to get in touch with you. <clears throat> now, hey, your membership—you've done a pretty good job. Then, yeah, we've over doubled. Yeah, we've over doubled our membership. We have now almost three thousand life members. Wow. We before COVID, we were almost triple in membership, but COVID has has really crippled us because we recruit a lot of new members at shows. At State of Maine Sportsman Show, we're one of the two partners on that show. And, and we get 150 to 200 members a year there. 
and then we do other shows in which so we get between four and five hundred members a year that way. We haven't been able to hold them, and it really has set us back around the membership. I did a podcast with Hal Blood. He's a he has a pretty popular podcast. Yeah, and uh, we had over fifty members from that podcast because of work we're doing restoring deer wintering areas in the state. And if you don't mind, I'll talk a little bit. No, about let's that. do that. That's really <clears throat> important. Um, well, as most anyone knows, if they travel into northern Maine, a lot of habitats disappeared. We used to have about 7% of the habitat on the landscape in deer wintering areas. Most of that's disappeared. It's down to 3% now. And so I've been trying for almost 20 years to, to get a policy from the state to start restoring deer wintering areas. I twice, twice tried to use the Land for Maine's Future program to do that. In this last session, we were successful in getting a 40 million, we led the, the, the charge to do that, a $40 million appropriation to wow. replenish the land for Maine's future, of which a portion is prioritized for the purchase of deer wintering areas. Good. So that was done. We purchased our first deer wintering area in, in Aroostook County. <clears throat> There's several more that are going to be announced midsummer. The, the other thing we did, and this is the icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned, the new restructuring of the antlerless deer permit system that just passed, mm -hmm. One of the conditions that I, that I said to the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is we'll support a restructuring and a fee for a second deer, but we want all the money to go into the deer management fund, which I created as a former senator. That fund allows that money to be used to purchase deer wintering areas and to manage them. Deer. <clears throat> and so we made some changes and restructured that management fund. The restructuring of the antlerless deer permit system now generates about $750,000 wow. a year, which is then matched three to one by federal money, Pittman-Robertson money. That all go now goes into that fund. So now, in addition to the LMF money, there's $3 million a year indefinitely that will go into purchasing and managing deer wintering areas in northern, eastern, and western Maine. So explain the new deer permitting uh, system. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Under the old system, some hunters, like myself, would get three or four permits. I'd apply for one, and I'd get three or four. It, it was getting very convoluted. Um, certain groups had come in and kind of diluted the system by getting permits for them and turning them sort of into a, huh, I got, a, I got yeah. my five permits this year, and then people would only use one. Well, that made a horrible management system because the biologists can't manage a growing population. It's funny. My consulting biologist, Jerry Levine, is viewed as one of the best biologists in the nation. He, he created the original system, and he's the one who told me that system's now broken because it had been changed to a political system, not a management system. So I said, well, Jerry, write me a new restructuring plan for that antlerless deer permit system, and I'll promote it. So he did, and working with Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, they came up with a new structure. The way it'll work now is... In each wildlife management district, they give so many <clears throat> permits. You as a hunter can apply for one. You can, under your regular license, shoot a buck. If you harvest a buck and you have a permit, you can shoot a second deer. And then that second deer, if you decide to use it, is a $12 fee. It's much like the September archery season where they pay for their permits. So you'll still be able to shoot your original deer the extra deer will be $12. What that does is it gives the hunter some incentive to harvest an animal because you're actually paying for your permit. And all that money will then go into this deer management account. So it would be that if I, like I apply for my doe permit every year, but I'm one of those guys that, eh, I didn't get out hunting, yeah, I got yeah. the permit. You know, if yeah. I want to go, I'm all set to go. I still would apply for that permit. Yep. I could still get that permit. That's right. I then can decide whether I'm taking a buck or a doe. That's right. If I You can take, take both. You can shoot a buck and a doe. If you get a doe permit and you pay your $12 fee, okay, okay, you can gotcha. then take two I deer. I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. And so the other thing is that sometimes the permits aren't, aren't um, applied for and they become bonus permits. There won't be any more bonus permits. They'll be sold over the counter. That's good. So you can go in and buy an extra permit. So anybody who wants a permit is likely to be able to get is one. Is it specific to in-state, out-of-state on buying the permit? Or is that it? That's great. That's, no. that's what we should be doing. No. I mean, when I was on Fish and Wildlife, I got very frustrated that we yes. weren't using, I mean, I don't want to make money on our game, but if we can make money to help support that, and you, you make yeah. sure of that and yeah. protect that money, that's, right. that's a good thing. It is, and the, the account where the money is is a non-lapsing account. The legislature can't sweep it. And the other thing that most people don't know is any fee generated 
by inland fisheries and wildlife has a constitutional protection. The legislature must appropriate the amount that the sportsmen pay in fees. So that money has two protections on it. Yeah, I remember that. And it used to frustrate me when, under a previous administration, not Janet, not uh, LePage, but back to Mil B Beldacci, he kept coming in there and taking money out of that yeah, account. He would sweep it. And he would sweep it. And even though we would argue, but the, the committee chairs would just go along with him taking it. I said, no, we, this is wrong. You, yeah. you can only take this <clears throat> much money out because that's our money that's that right. we put into it that's supposed to go doing yeah. that. So if you want to, you have some... I'll call it discretionary money that is not from the fees, that sits in an account. You want to sweep that, sweep it. Right. But then don't expand that into yours to say it's a 10% cut. It's 10% cut of that, right. not 10% cut of the whole budget. That's exactly right. And the way they got around that was for a, quite a while, the legislature had been appropriating some general fund money to support the department. The Baldacci administration couldn't sweep the fees that had been generated by sportsmen, but they could sweep all the general fund money that they had built programs on. So the option that, I was on the committee at the time, the option that was given to the committee was, if you want to save all these wardens' jobs, yeah. you've got to raise your fees. Yeah. And so I put up quite a fight on that along with some other committee members. He did it, but we made it hurt. And that's the way politics works. Politically, I think that damaged John Baldacci, yeah. Governor Baldacci. So the other one that we had just come up in the legislature was pretty controversial, was Sunday hunting. Yeah. And um, Scott Landry, as you know, lives in town. He and I are good friends. And we kind of talked a little bit about it. But tell me what happened. Because sure. I am, I'm, I make no bones about it, have been an advocate of Sunday hunting, particularly mm, so on my own I. land, for a long time. Yeah. I believe that if I have that land, I have a right to mm -hmm. the animals. The, to, I'm taking care of it because I'm either managing the forest mm -hmm. or yeah. doing something. Um, and I find it disappointing that they, we can't seem to get that Sure. Through. Now, I disagree with you on that. You have a right to all the rights of a landowner, but you don't have rights to the natural I, resources. Good, good point. The I mean, deer the, and the, the other the, animals. Yeah, animals. That's, right. that's, that's something that is... It belongs to the people. It belong, all the animals, yes. the natural resources, wildlife belong to the people, and it's their responsibility to manage it. It's a public trust doctrine. So what happened with this bill, and I, uh, full disclosure, Sam, ha our membership supports Sunday hunting, and we've always supported Sunday hunting, even when we've stood alone and all the other organizations are up there testifying against it. We, we took our beating testifying in favor of Sunday hunting. So let's not confuse your listeners that, that Sam is an advocate, but not this year, and this is why. This bill had a component of Sunday hunting in it, but it wasn't truly Sunday hunting. And I'll get to the two policies that were in it that are extremely concerning to our organization. It could have lasting implications on, on all hunters, not just those that want to hunt deer or whatever. So getting back to, to Representative Landry, one of my favorite people in the legislature is Representative Landry. He is a class act, an honest man, and, and don't tell him that, Jesus. Uh, I'm sorry, I gotta but put it's, up with it. Now. I gotta, I gotta call when I. If somebody does something wrong, I'll call them out. But if they do something good, I'll call them out too. And he's been a great legislator to work with. He's also a Sam member, and uh, not because he wants our influence, but because he supports the resource. So that being said, this Sunday hunting bill had in it two provisions that. Um, we, we at SAM have opposed. One of them, as you know, because you filled out our questionnaire, is reverse posting. Reverse posting is, um, right now we have what's called implied access. If it's not posted, yeah. it's assumed you have a right to recreate on it, not just hunt, but you can gain access. This bill had flipped that on its head and said, on Sunday, all of the land south of Route 2 is considered posted. Whether it's posted or not, it is considered posting on Sunday. That's reverse posting. Yeah. When candidates fill out our questionnaire, that's one of our highest priority questions we ask. Are you in support of reverse posting? So for those that supported this bill, nine of the members of that committee got our endorsement because they said no to reverse posting. So that caused some problems for the committee members right there. You had two policies that are passionately supported by Sam but are in conflict with each other. Yeah. So what I said in my testimony was, we support Sunday hunting. Please put out a Sunday hunting bill, but take reverse posting out. The second component is it's something, it's called the feudal system. Anybody that's listening can look it up. It's uh, from medieval times. The uh, kings would, would accept this policy. Um, it was a foundation of government that the king would reward nobility with things like land, um, 
and, and the right to hunt and fish. So when we founded this country, part of the battle was over who controlled those natural resources. So when in the, in the nobility system, nobility could hunt and kill animals, wild animals. Right. Commoners could not. And if they did and they got caught, some Never of the most coast. severe penalties were for those who killed the king's wildlife. That he, that was power. He could dole that out to nobility. If you think about what this bill did, it said that all those landowners, including those that have posted land, nobody can hunt on, can hunt on Sunday. When everybody else can't, unless you have written permission, the landowner allows you on. So that landowner for Sunday had complete access to those natural resources that nobody else could hunt. That's the feudal system. We strongly oppose that. Um, what would end up happening is if you've got land or you've got access to land that you know won't be posted on Sunday, you can hunt. Everybody else, you had to go get written permission. So it created two classes of people, those that had land, at land and those that did not. And we think we can do better than that. What has happened is that because there's been 30 years of attempts to get Sunday hunting, they're coming up with creative new proposals to try to either arm twist the landowners or a policy that would be accepting to the landowners. And they got a little too creative with this bill. And that's why it was doomed to failure right from the get-go. The other thing is that landowners are demanding something in return for access. And that's getting stronger and stronger every year. They want, they want pay to play. They want you to have to pay to use their land. And one of the largest landowners in the state is Weyerhaeuser. Again, look it up. One thing I like about Farmington, I'm going to get to the, to the Farmington folks. I was here in a debate, and I want to get back to it in a minute. Use, use the computer. Do your research. When um, I, I want to tell this story real quick. I want to interrupt this. Um, I was here in a debate, and there were some young, young people in the audience, you know, students here. And I was debating with Ethan Stremling, former senator, on gun, on gun control. And some of the facts they put out, the students in the audience were researching it while they were speaking. And they stood up afterwards and said, Senator Stremling, that's wrong. I'm looking at the information. I was there, I believe. You're yes, right. that was profound to me, how powerful computers are. And in this case, um, when, you, when, you, when you're researching um, legislation or whatever, you better have your facts straight. And in this case, when it comes back, comes back to Sunday hunting, when you start researching the bills, I guess the point that I was trying to make is what you see on social media, on Facebook, you had groups that were saying, this is Sunday hunting. Um, it wasn't Sunday hunting. But that's all the information you yeah, were seeing. Yeah. So you needed to see the other side of it. And that gets back to what, what point I was making. When you start you know, doing your own research, you become a more powerful policymaker. And in this case, we stood down because uh, other organizations who have been our friends in the past were promoting this bill. It wasn't put forward by the outdoor community. In the future, if, if there's a Sunday hunting proposal, it's going to have to be a, ne a negotiation between the landowners and the hunters of the state. You can't force it down their throat. And that's what this bill tried to do. The people that were advocating for it used tactics that really made the legislative committee mad. They made the administration mad, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. They really tried to shove it to them. And getting back to the policy, you can't do that when it's bad policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became a battle between how much influence you could get through social media and then kind of shove it down the, the committee's throat. So that's why I say, in the future, in order to get this done, research Weyerhaeuser, research pay-to-play. Weyerhaeuser is the, is the greatest advocate nationally and the biggest user of pay-to-play. Whether it's hunting or bird watching, in other states, they want you to pay to use their land. And you can research that right now yeah. while you're watching. Weyerhaeuser and other large landowners, they love it when... You, when you give all the control of the resource to them because they can demand things in return for you to pay to use their land. And that's something that's getting more and more prominent in Maine. Bear hunters in particular, guides, 
are purchasing hundreds of thousands of acres of, of, of land to bait on and exclusive rights to bait. That's in a sense pay to play. When you start saying all land is posted unless the landowner gives you permission, the use of exclusive hunting rights becomes even a bigger issue. Because if you've already got a relationship like that with a, with a guide, why not just extend it to Sunday hunting and keep everybody else out? You then create a, a monopoly of Sundays for landowners to sell hunts on their land. The way that and we're going to eventually have to face this as a, as a state, eventually um, we're going to have to have a debate on whether that's legal. You're not supposed to sell exclusive hunting rights on your property. But the way that some folks have got around that is they say, well, even though it may be gated or we have exclusive rights, you can hunt on it. You just have to walk. walk. And you can't use the uh, developed roads. It's like getting into a great pond. You know this because you yeah. were an ex-policymaker. And we've had this battle in the legislature quite a few times recently around this pay to play and the use of exclusive hunting rights. So this issue for your listeners is incredibly complex. It involves all kinds of user groups, multiple policies around reverse posting, the feudal system. I think we can do better than that, Tom. If we're going to have a Sunday hunting bill, put a straight up Sunday hunting bill out and let's have a policy debate. And if you know, passionately fight for it, and if you lose, lose. you lose. Yeah. That's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's 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 the insider's look at what just yeah. happened. And in I grew up, uh, well, when I worked for IP, we used to have a lot of land in the Adirondacks, and that's all pay to play. Basically, you would, we would make mm -hmm. money as a landowner by leasing it to a club. Right. And you, if you were a member of the club, you could hunt on that land. If you weren't a member of the club, you were excluded. In the South, it's all hunting clubs. Yeah. So it's, it's something that sits out there, and from the defense of the big landowners, they are paying the taxes on it. They are paying the road maintenance and so forth. However, as we talked, I can cross their land to yeah. get to the ponds that are there as long yeah. as it's defined as a great pond, That's right. and they can't stop me right. because I'm not, as long as I'm not walking, or I'm not posted the land, not walking on the stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I want to add one more com component to that. The, um, this idea of pay to play, most people in Maine have no idea what it's like in other states. No, we no. are so spoiled here. Yeah. We have a lot of small landowners who allow hunting, but some states, most states, especially in the Midwest, a lot of federal ownership of land, yeah. a lot of very large farming where you pay to use the property. And it's just, it's not apples to apples comparison. Maine is a very unique state with incredible opportunities to, to access public lands. Yeah. So David, we're almost at the end of the show already. Will yeah. you come back? Absolutely. Maybe what we can do this summer with Andre is go down and actually visit the center and film, yeah. do, a, do a show. We, we have our own filming studio. Oh, yeah. And if you'd like to come down, we absolutely could do that. I would do that. Uh, one of the things I'd like to cover with you is gun control and the current state of gun control debate. And so let's in have you country. come back and we'll do that. Yeah, absolutely. I will set up All a right. date before you leave. All right. David, it is All a right. pleasure. Thank you All so right. much. Sure. That was great. David Trahan from Sportsman's Alliance, good friend from a long time. Yeah, you too. And I, the chair, I got the answer. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.